our joint webinar today with Primus One Power on uh, wind and hybrid systems, how you can combine wind and solar to increase the reliability of your system. And uh, again, my name is Rob Rallo. I'm a senior engineer with Sunrise. And uh, I'm joined uh, today by uh, Ken Kodalik, uh, Director of Global Sales and Operations with Primus One Power. Um, as always, um, we will be recording this webinar and it will be available on our website within 24 hours. And if you have any questions, uh, if you would please put those in the question box. Uh, we will address those at the end of the webinar. Um, for those who are not familiar with SunWise, SunWise has 20 plus years of experience in off-grid power systems, um, mostly uh, in battery-based uh, battery systems, um, standalone uh, hybrids, which we're going to talk about the PV wind hybrid today, uh, battery backup, and uh, other off-grid systems or systems with unreliable power. We are uh, integrators, we provide complete system solutions, and uh, also distributors, so we can provide just products and videos as well. We have uh, manufacturing uh, and engineering facilities um, uh, in uh, Oregon and in New York. Our headquarters is in Oregon. We have sales offices throughout the country. And uh, again, we do uh, standalone PV systems. We can do mobile solutions for you as well, hybrid systems. CDC are also in a psychocharge uh, backup systems, both AC and DC UPS backup systems. We design our systems to IEEE, and we can do a UL listing on some of our equipment, depending upon which uh, products you're working with. And um, we also provide other value-added services. Some of the services include uh, technical specification writing, system design and engineering. We can do uh, site surveys, uh, installation services, uh, training, troubleshooting, and uh, much more. And uh, Ken is now going to tell you a little bit more about Primus. Thanks, Rob, and uh, appreciate uh, y'all being on the webinar today. Again, my name is Ken Kodalik. I'm with uh, Primus Wind Power, and uh, we are a, a company based out of Denver, Colorado, U.S. manufacturer of wind turbines. In fact, one of the only U.S. manufacturers left uh, in the wind turbine market. Uh, lots of folks in China and other places. Rob, have you given me control? Nope, not yet. Let me uh, give me one second here. Okay, thanks. So as Rob is switching me over there, I just want to tell you that we took over from a company some of you may be familiar with called Southwest Wind Power uh, back in uh, 2003, January or excuse me, 2013. And uh, so we've been with the uh, Air product line for four and a half years. Our mothership, our main company, is an aerospace company uh, building products, precision metal products for uh, NASA. Department of Defense and lots of large aerospace companies and we have our manufacturing facility in that same uh, facility where we have our aerospace facility and that's in uh, Denver, Colorado. So again, a U.S. made product. Oops. Oh, I got it. Okay, yeah, just a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to go over how wind and solar can work together, pretty much a complementary nature of that, and then how you can integrate these two technologies to work together. Also going to cover what additional materials you might need to do that. There are some additional parts that are required to uh, bring everything together. And then uh, finally, tower height recommendations and siting considerations, which can be very important in the performance of your uh, system. Okay, go ahead, Ken. All right. Rob, you had some poll questions, I believe? Oh, yes. Thanks for reminding me of that. Um, let's see, first question is, um, if anyone has... Um, if anybody's installed a system, a wind system before, or if they're familiar with it. So let's just wait a few seconds for people to respond. Also, a lot of people have worked with wind before. Almost half. Wonderful. Okay, I think the majority of people have voted, and it looks like Again, it looks like almost half the people, around half, have worked with uh, worked with wind before. I think it's wonderful. And I think we have one other question as well that I will bring up, and that is, what is um, 
when you're using a, a hybrid system, what is uh, the considerations you, you have with those? Is it maintenance and reliability, uh, understanding the wind resource, uh, how they can work together, or your familiarity with uh, wind turbines? And again, it looks like, okay, it looks like most people have voted now. And uh, interesting, uh, looks like, uh, go ahead and post these for everybody. It looks like um, it's uh, a lot of, it looks like it is a combination of pretty much equal between uh, maintenance and reliability, understanding the wind resource, and the solar and wind working together. So hopefully with the end of this webinar, everybody will understand those things better and feel uh, much more comfortable about how uh, solar and wind can work together uh, what is needed to do that, uh, when, it, when it does work well together, and what maintenance is required for that. So, okay, why don't we go ahead then and get started, um, Ken, with uh, talking about uh, how these two work together. Okay, again, thanks, Rob. And uh, so, so here's your, your standard hybrid system overview. You know, you're adding a turbine into an existing solar system or developing your own hybrid system, but it's two kind of autonomous Autonomous, autonomous systems working together. You got your PV panels. I'll show you a line diagram of this going into the battery bank, and then your turbine going into the battery bank as well. Our turbine connects directly to the battery bank, not through the PV charge controller, but directly to the battery bank. And here is your line diagram of that system. And so again, solar array through your charge controller, uh, ammeter, breaker, J box battery disconnect and then down to your battery and then you have your turbine then going through a uh, obviously ground as well through your stop switch uh, Rob will talk a little bit more about that ammeter breaker disconnect and then into your battery bank there's also another option down here that we talk about sometimes is with the diversion load controller that's a diversion capable controller like a TriStar 45 and Xantrax C40 and, and such and you can use the entire, all the um, energy that produced by the PV array and the turbine, um, if you have a diversion capable controller and a resistive load, you know, water heater and air heater that can take that extra energy. That's um, not often, um, it's about maybe 5 or 10% of our systems that uh, folks will do that, but that is possible with uh, this hybrid system. So when we're talking about hybrid systems, uh, one big consideration is tower height, and we have a, often have a lot of questions on, well, how tall should my tower be? What kind of tower should I put this on? Rob's going to talk a little bit more about tower options and what the tower options are, but I just want to say to you that obviously as you go up in tower height, you get out of that what we call surface roughness, that turbulent condition that's near the ground, and you get better energy production, power production out of your turbine the farther away you are from the surface roughness of the ground. So you can see from this diagram, just by going from 10 meters to 14 meters, you get an additional 20% out of a wind turbine in power production. So good idea to get that turbine up as high as you can. But when we're talking about a micro turbine, such as ours, um, that is 200 to 400 watts rated power, rated power, you know, the higher you go up, the more expensive that tower gets, the more expensive the guy wires get, the more expensive the wire down to the battery bank gets, the foundation, all those things get more expensive. So when you're talking about a turbine that costs $850 retail, does it make sense to go up? And the answer to that question is really probably no. Um, our, our turbines are usually installed between 30 and 45 feet. In oil and gas and other applications, remote applications and portable applications, they can be as low as 15 or 16 feet. And they work great especially if you have a good wind resource and especially if they're sited well um, and that uh, good wind resource is important we're going to talk more about that but also another thing we need to talk about is siting a wind turbine the most important thing to do when siting a wind turbine is, is just from this diagram right here is make sure your turbine is sited if possible on the prevailing wind side of any object that's going to cause turbulence such as a house a tree a, a, a row of trees, um, other large buildings, etc. 
So this is the best place for this turbine in this particular location or condition. If you do put the turbine behind a, a turbulent object, that, that means you just have to get it up high enough to get in what we call laminar flow wind. This is called turbulent wind around here, obviously from these objects that are causing this turbulence. But if you get it in this nice laminar flow, you're going to get the most power production out of that turbine possible because turbulent wind is the killer of wind turbines. So you want to try to stay, if you can, out of that turbulent wind condition. On the water, as in this condition, on a lake, an ocean, and so on, um, coastlines, you have really good wind, obviously, because you have zero surface roughness, roughness on the water here, good laminar flow. Uh, up on a hill, as the wind blows up the hill, the uh, laminar flow lines begin to compress as it moves up the hill, and that compression causes increased velocity in the wind speed, so therefore that's why you have increased higher winds on top of mountains and hilltops, and that's a good for a, a wind turbine, generally, if you have a location that's sited on the hill. On a cliff or a mesa or a plateau or a building, for that matter, you're going to have these turbulent conditions from the vertical faces of the plateau, the mesa, the building. So you always got to keep that in mind, right? In front of the, the, um, the vertical face and behind the vertical face or on top of the vertical face. So you have to get it far enough back to where you're back in that laminar flow. If you ever install your turbine on a building, which we do see, a number of building mount turbines on barns, energy sheds, and so on, you got to remember that that turbine is not going to perform as the power curve indicates because of that turbulent flow. All right, so always keep that in mind. If you install your turbine on a building, uh, you will reduce that power production by, you know, anywhere from 5 to 30 percent depending on the building and the design of the building. So let's talk about the hybrid system. That's solar and wind combined together. Uh, I, I'm talking to you from Flagstaff, Arizona today. It's, uh, it's a, uh, and I have a house here, and on my house I have an active PV system on my house, and I love it. It's great, but solar does have some drawbacks. It has obviously low output during winter months, right, when you don't have as much sun, December versus June, right? Solar has diminished output during bad weather. Right now in Flagstaff, we're having a monsoon storm coming in, so it's cloudly, a cloud across the, the sky. So my solar is diminished on my house right now, and obviously no output at night. But wind uh, does have the advantages of helping in those conditions where solar is diminished or reduced. The average wind speed, as you can see from these four tenants I'm, I'm showing you here, the average wind speed is higher during the winter months, which is very good for a hybrid system. Air density is higher during the winter months, and so I want to geek out for a second with you, just for a second, and talk to you a little bit about the wind power equation, which is here in red. It combines three factors, air density, wind velocity, which is cubed. That's the most important factor, obviously, since it's cubed and swept area. That means how big that rotor diameter of the blade set is, how long those blades are. That's what we call swept area or a colloquially wing in the wind. So those three factors are important when you're developing, developing a wind power calculation for how much you're going to get out of any wind turbine, not just ours. But you know, here in the U.S. we rate wind turbines by watts, which makes really no sense. So keep this in mind when you're looking at other turbines, especially Chinese turbines, that uh, a wadded rated output is usually based on a very high wind speed, 29 to 35 miles per hour. And if your site does not have that high wind speed, you're not going to get anywhere near that rated wadded watt output of that turbine because they're usually using an unrealistic expectation of the wind speed. So keep that in mind. Always pay attention to the power curve and know what your wind speed is at your site to make sure you are a good candidate for wind turbine. We're going to talk about how you do that in just a moment. So here we're now we're on this third tenant right here. Wind on average is stronger during inclement weather. The old saying when there's weather there's wind, that actually does hold true. Right now in Flagstaff it's cloud covered but there's wind because the monsoon storm is starting to move in and we have seven, eight mile per hour wind going on right now and increasing. So that usually does hold true. I'm going to show you some data to prove that. And wind more frequently does blow on those long winter nights. And so when you have no solar input into your battery bank, but your lights are on and your water pump is on in your off-grid system, potentially, um, you're going to have some power output if you have a hybrid system 
and, and a wind turbine in the mix. So here is kind of what we're talking about. Hybrid systems are complementary. In the summer months, the solar is doing all the heavy lifting, really probably minimal output from your turbine in the summer months unless there's a storm period or, or nighttime. But in the winter months, that turbine is helping tremendously because you typically have higher wind speeds in the winter months, you have more storms, you have less solar output. So this is the complementary curve of wind and solar. It's like Mother Nature telling us if we live off-grid, it's a good idea to incorporate wind and solar together. So, so the question is, all right, uh, now you, you might think that a, a wind turbine is a good idea for the off-grid system, but do you have the right wind resource? So looking at this map, the light to dark blue are good candidates for a hybrid system. They're, the darker the color of blue, the higher the wind speed in that location. And you can see many places here in the U.S. as well as in North America, Canada, and in Mexico, especially along the coastline, as well as all over the world, um, there are really good places for wind. Here you can see all along the coastlines, right? You have good wind and the blue color all along the coastline. Only place for good wind in Florida is along the coast and many, many places here in the southeast as well. Lots of good wind here in the northern sections of the United States. The Great Lakes has obviously great wind and you can see these islands of wind right here. These are mountaintops, right? The Rockies, the Cascades and so on. In the middle of the country right here, lots of good wind. That's why most of the industrial scale, the large 2.5 megawatt uh, utility scale wind turbines are located in the middle of the country because we have great wind right here where the high and low pressures converge um, in our weather system pattern. So lots of great places for wind throughout the United States and all over the world. So how do you look specifically at your location, at your customer's location? Well, we have a great resource that's free for all SunWise customers that are looking at um, determining whether uh, a hybrid system is right for their customer. So we have data that's 200 meter resolution data at 10 meter, as low as 10 meters of tower height. And so that's 33 feet. Um, and so what 200 meter resolution means that you pick a point and that point we have data for somewhere within that 200 meter radius of that point. So very good data uh, close to that site. And so how do you get that data? Well, you contact Sunwise or you can contact me directly at Primus Wind Power or right on our website, primuswindpower.com. You can go to what's my wind resource and provide me with uh, an address or decimal data coordinates or GPS coordinates for that site that you're looking at for an off-grid hybrid system. And we can let you know, hey, is it, a, is it a good site or not a good site? Our recommendation for a good site for a hybrid system for adding wind is 10 miles per hour or better of winter wind speed or four meters per second or greater. So that's 10 miles per hour or four meters per second of winter wind. We don't care what the average wind speed is. What you focus on is the winter wind speed because that's when you need the power into that battery bank. That's when you need those amps flowing into the battery bank is in the winter when your solar system is not doing as well, especially during storm periods and elongated storm periods. So we talked about this air density. Um, this chart just show, basically shows you as the air, density, air, air temperature decreases, the density increases. So the conclusion is the colder the wintertime temperatures, the more power production you're going to get out of your wind turbine. It's just physics. And so we talked about this idea when there's weather, there's wind, right? This is NREL data from 30 years on the 239 NREL sites. So I wanted to look back at these sites, use real data um, from these 239 sites that, are, um, that NREL has and say, hey, does this really hold true? And what we did was we, we looked at different sites and we really proved that, that when it's less sunny, it tends to be more windy on average during bad weather periods, during you know, storms. And so you can see here as the solar energy decreases on this axis, the wind energy increases. And in a place like Rapid City, South Dakota, it's well pronounced with a 23% improvement. Cheyenne, Wyoming, also fairly well pronounced with 19%. And then in a place like Amarillo, Texas, a little less pronounced, but certainly there, the conclusion when it's less sunny, it tends to be more windy, which will help that hybrid system and help support that battery bank. 
Also, we wanted to prove this complementary nature of wind and solar, this complementary curve. So again, NREL data using three sites here. And um, so Billings, Montana, the most pronounced, right? The red is the wind, the blue is the solar, the middle is the summer months, and here's the winter months. So in the summer, lots of solar, not a lot of wind, and opposite effect in the winter months, right? Lots of wind, not a whole lot of solar. If you ever been to Billings in the winter, you know that to be true. And so again, Fargo and Minneapolis, the curve is a little more less pronounced, but certainly true that you have that effect of that complementary nature of wind and solar uh, during the winter months, which makes all the difference in the world for your battery bank. So again, solar day, you guys who are installers, you obviously know this intuitively, as well as people know this in common sense. Your customers know that there's a big difference between June and December in terms of the solar day and how many sun hours you're going to get out of your solar system. Right now you're getting, you know, seven, eight, nine sun hours out of, your, out of your system, but in December, three, four, five, right? So depending on where you are on the planet, um, so it's, and that's why most people size their systems for the middle of December. Um, for an off-grid system, right? You're sizing your battery bank, you're sizing your PV array, you're sizing your racking, your controller, everything for that condition in the middle of December, as well as your days of autonomy, right? And, and the storm periods in there, right? And so you're putting three, four, five days of autonomy into that system, so that's increasing the size of your solar panel, your PV array, your racking, everything, battery bank. But that whole paradigm changes by adding a wind turbine into the mix. So you're, you're really thinking about how you can size now your PV array and all your equipment differently. You can downsize it in general when you have a wind turbine or two in the mix in your hybrid system within the right wind conditions. And remember that wind condition is 10 miles per hour or greater, winter wind speed, four meters per second or greater winter wind speed. So a whole paradigm shift here when you're talking about a hybrid system. Nighttime power production too, right? Because you're getting that amps into the battery bank at night. So again, this is NRL data, Cheyenne, Wyoming, winter months, 1990. Um, you're seeing, you know, lots of uh, wind energy coming into that battery bank at night, lots of wind. Uh, if you've ever been to Cheyenne, Wyoming in the winter months, you absolutely know this to be true, as well as many places in the winter months have this condition. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to keep the battery bank happy. This is a Trojan brochure. They never recommend you go below 80% uh, depth of discharge on their batteries, and then that's typical throughout most flooded lead acid batteries, right, which is 90% of the systems we work with, maybe 95% uh, of the systems we work with use FLA batteries. So really what they're, you're sizing for is, right, this, this magic 50% max depth of discharge, but if you have a wind turbine in the mix, you could push that potentially up into this 30 or 40 percent range and look at how steep that curve gets when, uh, in terms of cycle life, and that's how long your batteries are going to last, right? Uh, when you are a maximum of 30 or 40 percent depth of discharge. This means your batteries are going to last instead of maybe for a sealed battery three or four years, they might last four or five years for a uh, flooded lead acid battery. Uh, it, maybe it'll maybe it'll last six, seven, eight years if you take really good care of it with a turbine in the mix. It might last 10, 12 years, maybe even longer, depending on how depth, deeply you, you discharge that battery bank. So really, it's all about taking care of the batteries and making sure you don't have a storm period where you have no sun. You're not running your generator to full charge on the batteries, right? Because nobody wants to run the generator that long to fully charge the batteries to get to that absorb mode, right? So with the wind turbine in there, you will help those batteries tremendously, assuming you have the correct wind resource. So the Air product has been around a long time, starting with the Air 303 right here in Flagstaff. It was developed um, on Loop Road and 1995, first micro wind turbine on the market. Lots of you know people doing their own thing, but it was really the first uh, manufactured, a uh, mass manufactured wind turbine on the market. And then you had the 403, and then you had the Air X and the Air 30, and then uh, the Breeze and the 40, and all these wind turbines we still sell today. 
and we just launched in 2015 the Air Silent X, which is a very, very quiet turbine. So many years of benefits from the improvements to the control algorithm, to the circuit card, to tweaks to the uh, blade sets, to all kinds of improvements to the turbine uh, that make it a very reliable turbine today, which is important to you guys as you indicated in the poll question. Reliability is important. This is a simple turbine, it's a bulk charger, um, and it works really well with solar. We keep it simple because we want it to be reliable. It has a pot screw on the side of the turbine, a potentiometer screw to change the potentiometer setting, but it's a mechanical screw, very reliable, uh, very reliable stator that will last 25 years. Circuit card, relatively simple. The really our secret sauce is in the control algorithm of the turbine to make sure it shuts down at wind speeds that are going to hurt it and then starts up again in the proper amount of time. So this turbine has been around for a long time. Thousands, over 150,000 of these turbines out there in the market. We have the authorized service distributors all over the world to make sure that you can get parts and pieces pretty much anywhere on the planet. So really a good turbine to go with if, if reliability and um, service is important to you. Um, here's the turbines themselves, right? It weighs 15 pounds, 1.2 meter rotor diameter, that's 46 inches, micro turbine. Uh, very unique design that's been around, like I said, a long time. This is the land turbine. It's a gray cast aluminum housing. This is the marine turbine, which has a, a, a marine grade corrosion resistant finish on there. Um, but basically, we have six models of this turbine in all the voltages, 12, 24, and 48 volts uh, for this particular turbine. We do have this blade set that is upgradable with any of our turbines. It does make the turbine very, very quiet. It's a very fancy, high-tech, carbon fiber hand-laid blade sets with, uh, with aerodynamic trips on the um, trailing edge. And it's very, very quiet. Um, and if you have a turbine that is out there or customers say they have a turbine that's out there that's loud, like the Air X, which is a loud turbine, um, you can upgrade the turbine to this blade set Sunwise can provide this for you uh, and make that turbine um, very, very quiet. Any turbine worth its salt, any turbine, has to have a power curve, and that power curve has to be certified. All of our turbines have been certified by CSA and many um, other certification organizations. So when you're buying a turbine, always keep that in mind, especially the turbines coming out of China and most of those aren't certified, in fact, I don't think any of them are, so always be looking for that power curve, and if that power curve is certified. Um, here's the power curve for the Air 40 and the Air Breeze in red, and the Air 30 and the Air X Marine in blue. The reason why you have this big jump right here at the higher wind speeds above about 24 miles per hour is because the, that particular turbine spins at a higher RPM, 1800 RPMs, and so it can output more power. We control the RPMs with the Air 40 and the Air Breeze turbine to limit the sound output so it's quieter. That's why the Air X and the Air 30 turbines are very loud because they have a very high RPM and they have a function in the turbine that uh, is older and makes them more loud. So we only use those Air 30 and the Air X turbines for very high wind speed industrial applications. But you can see here the Air 40 will follow the power curve of the Air 30, but produce a little bit more power than that Air 30 at the low wind speeds because it's optimized for uh, uh, more power production at the lower wind speeds. So always remember, a power curve is important to, uh, to make sure you look at when you're looking at any turbine. So also you um, were concerned about maintenance and repair, and that's something uh, that's important as well. The maintenance on the air turbine is very, very simple. Every 18 months or so, you need to get up to the turbine, check the blade set, check the uh, bolt connections to the yaw, that's where it connects to the tower, uh, and the blade, blade bolt connections to the hub. Um, there's some great videos on our website on how to do all this, service and repair, troubleshooting, uh, circuit replacement. Our turbine is very simple to replace parts and pieces in. You can do it yourself, and we have great videos on our website to do that. Um, also, great videos on webinars to teach your customers uh, about wind and how to take care of their turbines. So I would highly recommend going to this, uh, to this site 
to our website to look at that and there'll be links to that from the um, Sunwise website. So uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, I believe Rob's going to now take over and uh, talk a little bit more about how Sunwise can support hybrid systems as well. Thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, so let me let me uh, try to fill in some of the blanks and what other additional equipment is needed. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about regulators, uh, disconnects, stall switches, installation kits, and tower kits. So first, the regulator. Uh, the air machines include a bulk charger in them, as Ken had talked about. It is a bulk charger, though. It does not include temperature compensation. It is not a very sophisticated device, but it's a great way to get current into your battery. Um, so that being the case, uh, those and generally that wind machine is set at a slightly lower voltage for charging your battery than, say, the solar charger. That allows the solar charger to do the finished charging, the more sophisticated charging, the absorption for the batteries. So that's a that's a great way to do it. Again, this is how these two uh, machines can work well together. You can have one just put current in there, and the other one can do kind of the finished charging. Uh, also, um, the Wind turbine and the solar do work separate and autonomously from each other. They are completely two separate uh, sources of, of uh, energy, and they do work uh, autonomously and separate from each other. So if something should happen to the solar, you could wimp, wimp along with the wind depending on how much wind you have at the time of year and things like that. So they do work together, and yet they're also uh, separate, so they can be more reliable that way as well. But again, uh, it is best to try to do the finished charge with the solar. Uh, if you are using a wind machine, uh, independently and separately by itself. There are ways to kind of uh, do that. You can add, as, as Ken showed in one of the slides, you can add to this a uh, load diversion charger that can include temperature compensation and can do more, more of a uh, sophisticated charge. But uh, again, with working with solar, no reason for that at all. You can let the solar charger do the, uh, do the more sophisticated charging for you on your system. Stall switches. Okay, stall switches can act as uh, and a very important accessory to have. Uh, they can act as a junction box for you to, to do the wiring. Uh, it can also uh, act as a disconnect point and a troubleshooting location. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, you can see there's a couple of photos here. You've got uh, a couple of uh, uh, examples of stall switches, including an old one that uh, Sunwise used to make. And uh, here's kind of a picture of our newer one that we're now making. This one is uh, improved over the other one. It is corrosion resistant, need more flex enclosure. That's an important thing. So whether you're working in a marine environment, as Ken showed, wind resources great along the coast, but uh, that, that coastal breeze also has salt in it. It's going to make certain that your equipment can handle that. So this is another great reason to have a corrosion resistant uh, stall switch box. Um, it also has a shunt for measuring output current, so you can uh, check and see what the, what the performance is. Grounding location. Uh, it also includes your overcurrent protection, your terminal box, and that important stall switch. Now, uh, why do you need a stall switch? Well, what a stall switch does is it actually shorts the wind turbine plus and minus wires. Uh, and the re and when it does that, it'll actually, when it shorts that out, it'll actually stop the blades from spinning. There are two reasons you might want to do this. The first reason is, is that if you're working on the wind machine at all, you certainly don't want the blade spinning when you're up there on the tower, or even if you lower it down the ground level. You do not want those blades spinning. It's a very dangerous situation. So to get those blades to stop spinning, you literally short the plus and minus wires. So that's a very important feature to have for maintenance. The other reason that's useful is if the wind turbine is taken out of service for an extended period of time, it is also good to short those blades out. Now, um, the regulator does have uh, some st has uh, circuitry in it such that if the battery is disconnected from the system, it will sense that and it will uh, uh, periodically shut the machine down, but it will also come back to life every so often, every few minutes, check, and then go back offline again. This may not be a situation you want to have long term, temporarily, for short term that's fine, but if you're taking it out of service again for an extended period of time, you don't want that going on. So you would want again use the stall switch for that reason. So again, it's a very important thing to have for both maintenance, for safety purposes, and also for, if for any reason you're taking your wind machine out of service for an extended period of time. Okay, uh, in the install kit, we're including output cable, uh, splice terminals. Uh, there's, uh, the output wires out of the um, wind machine are only about 30 inches long, and keeping in mind these are uh, anywhere from a 27 foot to a 30, 45 foot pole. So you're going to need to uh, do a splice in there. So you have inline splice terminal blocks that you'll actually make the splice inside the pole, and they will go inside the pole. 
and you can attach that to the uh, number six three conductor output cable that we're going to include. That's for your plus, your minus, and your ground. And uh, six gauge may sound a little bit big, but keeping in mind on your 12 and 24 volt systems, if you're on a 45 foot pole, that's a lot of uh, a lot of potential voltage drop for your 12 or 24 volt battery. So that's the reason to go to a slightly bigger cable uh, for that. So we do recommend the six gauge and again the three connectors for the plus to minus in the ground. You got your splice terminals that go in line and your cord connectors to strain relief that cable. So that's what's included in the uh, install kit. So between um, so between the install kit and your stalls box and your uh, wind machine, you have most of what you need. The only thing you're missing is the tower and there are several options for this tower there are lattice or truss standalone pole and uh, guided and uh, uh, we do sell kits for the guided I'll go into that in more detail but first let me talk a little about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of the different options okay with the tower or lattice type uh, they're generally climbable uh, they can be assembled on site they do require concrete and they do require a large base footprint for that uh, and depending upon the type being used, I uh, might need guide wires or not. Uh, a monopole or a standalone tower uh, can usually be a little more attractive. Um, you might see those in some of the new telecom towers. I think a lot of the telecom towers are using those. They do not require guide wires, but you have height limitations because, again, you're talking about a single pole. So there might be height limitations on that. They do require extensive uh, foundation concrete as that pole is sunk into the ground to prevent it from falling over. So the nice thing about the guided towers are they're relatively inexpensive, they're easy to raise and lower, they can be assembled on site, uh, and actually they do not, and uh, depending upon the application, they may or may not require civil works at all. So that's really nice not to have to do civil works on a site. The negative is because of the uh, guide wires, they do require a larger area overall um, in terms of the, uh, the land being used because, again, you have to sink those uh, guide wires into the ground somewhere. So, and those are in, those are installed in the ground using anchors, and uh, so if you're using guide wires, you'll have to have anchors. There are several different types of anchors. Uh, we have, um, here we're representing an auger type, duct bill, buried concrete, and then a uh, eye bolt type with cement. Um, generally, the auger types, are, they're just kind of screwed into the ground. Then you have the uh, arrowhead type with a cable on it. Those are driven into the ground such that the arrowheads are uh, set, so they're parallel with the surface. Then, of course, concrete, where you can uh, sink the actual anchor in with that or with a, um, uh, an eye bolt sticking up that you can attach your guy wire to. And the last type is uh, pins, uh, rock anchors, basically. That can be used if you're on a very rocky site, if you're on a mountaintop, as these things work well on top of. Uh, you may have uh, a lot of rock. It's hard to sink concrete or anything else into, but you could sink a rock anchor into that and use that as your anchor point. So something to consider. Uh, here's just a little chart, and you can find this on the Promise One Power website. Uh, just basically giving you the different types of soil and the types of anchors that work best with that type of soil. So depending upon your site location, the soil you're working with, you might want to use a different type of anchor. Okay, uh, we offer uh, four different types of tower kits. Uh, the fourth one isn't going to be used a lot. Uh, that would be the last one there, the uh, nine-foot uh, air marine uh, aluminum pole set. That's designed more for uh, sailboats and boating and stuff like that. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, the 29-foot easy tower kit includes everything. That's why it's easy. It has everything you need in it, and I'll talk about that in more detail. The 45-foot and 27-foot guided tower kits include the parts for that. It does not include the pole. That's the big thing there is you have to provide your own pole for that one. For those two, okay. Let me talk about this in a little more detail. Okay, so again, as I said, the Easy Tower Kit includes everything: it includes the pole, the earth anchors, guy wires. It does not require civil works. It is easy. Everything in one kit. Um, and here's just kind of a quick photo of that. You can see here you got your uh, get your tower base here. Uh, you got your two, couple different guide wires. Uh, here's your anchor, and uh, you've got your cable clamps, nibbles, and this is your pipe right here. You got a couple different sections of it depending upon. Uh, where the guides attach and things like that. Okay, as I mentioned, the uh, 45 foot and 27 foot uh, kits include the guide wires and things like that. So they include the tower base, the guide wires, and the set of kit. It does not include the anchors, and it does not include the pipe. Those are very important. Uh, again, then this may be preferable to you uh, if you want to just get the pipe locally. You don't have to worry about the shipping. That might be an advantage. And the anchors, you, you may want to use different anchors anyway, depending upon your application of soil that you have. 
Uh, 27 foot is pretty much exactly the same thing. It's just for a 27 foot uh, tower instead of a 45 foot. Okay, the uh, marine kit actually ends up consisting of two kits together. That would be the four foot aluminum set with the marine grade tower hardware kit. Okay, that's because it's all stainless steel. And again, it's designed for sailboats and things like that. Uh, in most cases, you're going to want your, your uh, wind turbine to be probably about 30 feet in the air around there. 10 feet's not going to get you a whole lot. You're probably going to have a whole lot of uh, turbulence in the air, so you're not going to get a whole lot of wind out of that. But if you're in an application where that is okay, or if that's all you can do, or whatever it is, or in a highly corrosive area, that might be something to consider. Uh, it does include the mast, the stays, vibration dampeners. Again, it is designed for attaching the sailboat. And again, the stainless steel hardware because it's designed for marine environment. There's kind of a picture of it attached on the back of a sailboat. Okay, so in summary, Again, uh, wind and solar, I think we've, I think Ken did a great job of showing the real data to explain why these two work so well together. When there isn't the sun, there's usually the wind. So again, these are really good complementary sources of energy that can make your system a little more reliable and uh, help your batteries last a little bit longer. Uh, I think we've shown that the air uh, wind turbines are uh, easy to work with and that they work well with the solar. Um, again, you got simple wiring connections as I talked about. You, all you really have is three connections, plus, minus, and ground. And we've got some wonderful kits and accessories to go with that. Uh, remember, again, the wind machines are just a bulk charger. Uh, they do not have a temperature compensation. They don't have an absorption mode or anything like that. So, uh, again, they're just kind of a bulk charger. If you need more sophisticated charging, I would rely on the solar for that. Or, again, we can add some additional charge regulation to the wind machine using diversion controllers and uh, things like that. Um, again, you need to make certain you do have enough wind. Um, there, there are plenty of places on that map in the country, especially in the southeast, where there just isn't enough wind for it to make sense at all. So again, consult with uh, us or with uh, Primus Wind Power as to whether uh, you have enough wind for your location, if there's any question at all. And again, don't forget your accessories, your stall switches, your install kits, your tower kits, etc. And uh, remember, again, sighting, very important, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, you want to make certain that you are, uh, don't have any turbulence from trees, buildings, other things like that. And uh, again, feel free to uh, refer to the Promise Swim site or to uh, Sunwise for help on your um, wind and uh, sighting uh, needs. For additional uh, information, um, we have, again, once again, always, Sunwise has got lots of wonderful information on our Tech Notes page. And uh, Primus, again, has got some wonderful information on maintenance, servicing, installation, things like that on their website. Uh, on both the uh, Sunwise website and the Primus website, we have wonderful uh, webinars here um, that we've pre-recorded that you're welcome to uh, go through and look at. Paul, stop, rewind. Um, and again, this will be up there as well in about 24 hours for you to review as well if you want more information or if you missed something, had to take a call in the middle of this. So again, uh, feel free to go back through to, our, to uh, these webinars and uh, refer back to the information that we presented for you. And again, for additional information, uh, we have uh, other engineering technical bulletins on the Sunwise website. Okay, and before we take some questions, I got one last polling question. I'm going to quiz everyone and ask, what is the threshold for good wind? Actually, this one's a bit of a trick question because there's actually two answers. <laughs> okay, I think we've got uh, a little better than half people have voted. Okay, we can close that and I'll show the results. And uh, again, the answer is, as Ken has said before, it's either 10 miles per hour or 4 meters a second. Uh, for those that like metric or those that like English units. So uh, those that picked either one of those answers, that is correct. That's what you want. Um, again, that's and that's the wind speed you're looking for in the winter time. Again, because that's when you're going to have the least amount of sunlight in North America. Or you're going to want to supplement that solar with the wind. Um, a great application for these is any place across the North United States, as you saw in that Midwest region, Montana, North Dakota. You saw how well the wind there, when you have lousy sunlight in the winter time, work well. Canada. Uh, another great place to be using the wind machines. They do work well in cold environments, so another great way to supplement your battery to, to help you get through those winter months until the sun can help take over in the summertime. 
Okay, so um, with that being said, uh, we have we'll, we're uh, open now to take questions that you may have. Something we may not have, uh, something you may have, um, not be clear on that we want us to clarify, or anything else about uh, how wind and solar can work together that we may not have answered, or um, or that you may have additional questions on. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Ken. We do have a, a couple really good questions already. I encourage everybody else, um, if you're on the fence about it, to throw in your question. And we'll get to those here in a minute as well. Um, so the first question that we have um, from Russell is um, how these turbines handle icing conditions uh, in the winter, which is a great question. And I'll, I'll let uh, Ken, you can speak to that, Rob, either one of you guys. I'm not sure what one to address. Great, thanks, Errol, and, and thanks, Russell. So uh, the, the turbine blade set is relatively small, and it's black, as you can tell, um, and it's fairly smooth. So uh, icing is typically not an issue. We have turbines all over the Arctic, Antarctic, and, uh, and it does not typically uh, 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 have an icing issue. Um, when the turbine blade starts to spin, uh, especially in higher wind conditions like you'll get in the winter in those locations and most locations that you're going to have that condition, uh, the blade set will uh, start to release that ice if there's any on there and it's not a problem that we've heard about in tech support and I've been with this turbine for 10 years now. The the only thing that is a, is a consideration for uh, winter conditions is bearings. And so, you know, the, the turbine is designed to go to down to negative 25 degrees and uh, even colder, and bearings can get a little stiff, but as soon as the um, a turbine blade set starts to spin and the, the, and the yaw starts to yaw, the, those bearings then by friction start to heat up, and then uh, they loosen up, and then everything's fine. So uh, really, uh, that's a, we don't really see that um, icing condition on these micro turbines. You, you tend to see that more on the larger turbines with the much bigger blade sets, wider blade sets, uh, and so on, but not necessarily on these micro turbines. Thanks, Ken. Anything else you want to add to that, Rob, before I move on to the next one? Nope, I will let Ken uh, take, is, is the wind expert, okay. take care of that one. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, the next question from Mark is, if we wanted to potentially integrate one of these air turbines into a grid-connected system, uh, what conditions may be um, prevalent or that we would want to look out for? Rob, uh, do you want me to take that one? Uh, I think either of us could probably take that one. Um, uh, well, let me, let me start with this one. Uh, the wind machines are designed to work with a DC battery, so that is needed. Um, so if you're trying to do a grid tied, a grid connect, this will not work for you. However, if you do have a battery bank you're working with, then you could potentially supplement with that. Then any, and if you have a um, a uh, a grid connected battery backup type inverter charger, then it could potentially be used to uh, back feed the battery to get through that inverter. But you need a whole lot of additional equipment, and again, you would have to have uh, the grid tie system be designed for that. Um, I missed anything else there, Ken? No, that's exactly correct, and and I would say I don't typically recommend that. I would not recommend it because it does add a lot of additional expense. The turbine, as Rob said, must see battery voltage to operate. It will not operate without a battery um, connect without a battery connected to it. And then you'd need that grid capable uh, controller in the mix there with the inverter, then to feed back into the grid, and uh, that just adds a lot of um, uh, expense as well as, as well as uh, uh, <laughs> we'll just say expense into the system that's not really necessary or makes a lot of sense for a, a turbine that you know has a relatively low output at 1.2 meter uh, 1.2 meter ro rotor diameter. This is really just a supplement for a solar off-grid system, um, so th that that is not a highly recommended uh, way to use our turbine. I will say this, though, if you are perhaps in an area along the coast of Florida or in Louisiana where you are worried about hurricanes or something like that, and you already have a battery-backed-up grid-connected system, then yes, you could think about adding this to it. But again, I would not recommend it unless you already have a battery-backed grid-connected system. Um, while we're on that question, uh, Mark did mention um, the SMA Windy Boy inverter. I'm not familiar with that exact product. Are either one of you guys familiar with that? Is that a direct-to-wind inverter product? 
Uh, it is, and it's designed for a completely different wind machine. Again, it's designed for yeah. for AC use and for other wind machines. Um, it is it it has nothing to do with the uh, the Primus uh, micro wind wind turbine, which is designed specifically for charging uh, DC batteries. Am I missing else on that, Ken? Thanks, Rob. Nope, that's correct. Okay, next question. Um, we had a question from. Um, George, on adding a Primus wind power to an existing third-party solar system. Um, as we covered, um, the wind turbine works independently, um, so can be added as a standalone addition to any existing solar system with a battery bank. And Rob and Ken, I'll just have you guys go ahead and confirm that again. Absolutely, it's it's a great idea. Um, you absolutely can if you're, and perhaps it might be a great idea solution if you're having a system that is having a little trouble getting through the winter. This might be a great way to supplement that and and uh, add to it. Definitely, absolutely, good idea. Absolutely, but you always want to check your wind resource at that site. So contact Sunwise or Primus to determine the wind resource at site to make sure you have appropriate wind to add a wind machine and for it to um, be worth the money, right? We want to have that wind resource there. Absolutely. Okay, we got uh, one more question on just general cost for equipment and install. Um, from Hugh, I have a feeling he's just trying to get a pulse um, for ballpark figures. Ken, I believe you mentioned um, that some of your major um, Air Series retail for about uh, $850. Um, and I believe the most basic um, of the guide tower kit, the 2745, I think they're um, like two, three hundred dollars or a little bit more for the smallest one. Um, and then you're probably, if you source your pole and your uh, and your anchors locally, and you probably have um, you know uh, uh, some on-site install, even if you had to pay for a third party. I'm thinking probably anywhere between twelve hundred and fifteen hundred dollars would probably get you a complete standalone wind system. Uh, absolutely, that's that's what I usually uh, quote around fifteen hundred, and that's for the just for the equipment, you know, and then the install obviously would be more, but and, and that would include a um, your uh, wind control panel or or your system for uh, the stall switch and so on, and your breaker and those items needed uh, and you can get it even down below that if you if you go with a very very basic system so yeah that that's a good number to work with thanks thanks appreciate the confirmation and that 850 by the way is uh, the price for a land turbine when you're talking about a, a marine turbine you go up to more like a about 1150 for a marine turbine and I just had a Perfect. I had a question everybody's asking how and where can you buy this? And my answer is contact your local Sunwise salesperson. They'd be happy to quote you and help you uh, add um, a wind turbine to your system, either existing or for future ones. Uh, you can also go to our web store if you're not familiar, sunwiseconnect.com, and there's a manufacturer's drop down. You can choose Primus Wind Power and you can see all the products that they have available on our web store. So just a little plug there. Um, okay, so next question, um, uh, this is from Charlie, um, and it's a good one, and he was just wondering if we could elaborate briefly on some of the most likely turbine failure events that we might want to be aware of. What could possibly go wrong, what does go wrong, and how could we potentially be prepared for it? Good question. Uh, I can't take that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great question, Charlie. Because unfortunately, wind does have it. You know, as you know, probably Charlie has a, a can have a bad reputation. There's a lot of bad players out there, especially in China, that build a very very inferior equipment. Um, so with our equipment, uh, the first thing you got to be aware of is the blade set needs to be changed out about every five to seven years due to UV degradation, uh, nicks, chips in the blades. Uh, a set of black blades is 120 bucks retail. Uh, so the blue blades are more expensive. They're a little over 300 um, for these, you know, very fancy blade sets. And they, uh, and then the other, uh, so really a blade set is is what's going to need to be changed out. And then the circuit card, which is the brains of the turbine, it control it, it controls the turbine. It has the rectifier block. It has the algorithm, the pick chip algorithm in there. 
it's kind of the brains of the turbine, it's the electronics of the turbine. Um, that uh, can fail after anywhere from five to 15 years. We just, you, it just depends on what's happening. We've had those things last even longer. Uh, but um, the circuit uh, a card kit, the circuit kit itself, retails for 240 bucks. And so with this new circuit in there, um, that will make the turbine um, last uh, another, you know, seven, eight, ten years or so. So really those are the two, and then there's the bearings, right? You want to change out the bearings every six, seven, eight years, depending on if it's a marine environment or land environment. Uh, a bearing set's 40 bucks for yaw and, um, and face bearings. So really those are the three big conditions of, of failure modes for the turbine. And that circuit kit is easy to change out. You can go to the um, our video on the website uh, to see how that works. It can be done in the field. It can be done very easily uh, 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 by either us or one of our ASDs, our authorized service distributors, or I would say 70% of our customers do it themselves. So very simple turbine to work on and, and relatively inexpensive parts uh, uh, for long-term use. Thanks. Great question. Or great response, guys. Um, next question. This one should be uh, relatively straightforward. Um, and can we can uh, take this direct if necessary? Don't need to go too deep. Um, are you aware of anybody who uh, services or repairs the original generation of Air 303 or 403? <laughs> yeah. So those are between 20 and 25 years old, right? Because Southwest Wind Power yep. manufactured those um, in the 90s. Um, and so, unfortunately, the only parts we have left for the 303 and the 403 are blade sets, hubs, and nose cone. The circuit card. Okay. He actually, he actually asked about the nose cone on one of the earlier uh, parts. So I'm going to respond. To yep, we have a nose cone for the 303 and 403, <laughs> but no circuit cards <laughs> or bearings or any of the, any of the other equipment left, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, turbines out there still working. Those those were great turbines, just like the ones we built today. Uh, it's amazing how long, uh, you know, those have lasted. <laughs> yep, I guess maybe still limping along. Might just need uh, one or two more parts. Okay, uh, la last question that I have in here um, from John, and I'm going to read the question and I'll respond to it really briefly. And I'll let you guys elaborate on. The question is: What type of solar charge controller, MPPT versus PWM, is best for wind turbines? And what type of issues will you see with the wrong solar charge controller? So I want to clarify that in, tip, in the situations we've been talking about, that the wind turbine is going to connect directly to the battery bank and should be independent and unaffected by what type of solar charge controller you may use. Now, there may be other um, interactions um, between the two systems that I'll let you guys speak on, um, but from a high level, you can use either one. Yeah, that, that is correct, Errol, exactly what you say. The turbine has its own, what we call, up-tower internal charge controller. That's done in the circuit card, uh, and it, it, it uh, regulates when the turbine reaches for a 12-volt system, 14.1 volts, for a 24 system, 28.2. It shuts down, and then when it goes 5% below that, it turns back on. It's a very simple, as Rob indicated, bulk charger. It does not need or does not go through the solar charge controller. Now, that being said, there is charge controllers out there. They're all PWM, the Xantrax, or Xantrax C40, the um, TriStar 45, which is highly recommended by Morningstar. Um, those do have diversion capable, and you can run the turbine into that, uh, or the turbine still runs into the battery bank, but off of that comes the uh, the charge controller that get, then can divert that wind energy, in, and it is PWM. Into uh, into a diversion uh, load like a air heater or a water heater. Uh, so, uh, but I like to you know I like to clarify that that should not be needed. Um, again, uh, uh, the, the MPPT versus PWM charge controller for the solar is for the solar, and as Errol said, is separate and autonomous from the wind. So uh, uh, again, which one you have um, will not affect or interfere uh, with the wind machine at all. If you think, you, and again, um, you should not need a supplemental uh, charging device like the diversion unit unless you don't perhaps have the solar to do the finished charge. So if you need a more sophisticated charge controller, for some reason, I'm not certain why, again, if you're working with a standalone wind, um, then you might want that. Then you can add um, a diversion type unit like the uh, C40 or the TriStar uh, 45. 
with a uh, load uh, dump um, then then can be used for that. But again, if you've got the solar there, you should not need that. It should be not needed. And again, the solar can either be a PWM or MPT, whatever you want. It makes no difference. It has no bearing at all on the performance um, with the web machine. Thanks. Appreciate that. All right. Um, well, I'll give people a few more seconds to get in any other questions uh, that they may have. Um, but if there's nothing else, um, then I think we've addressed most of the ones that have come through so far. All right. I think okay, that's I, it. I think we've answered yeah. everybody's questions. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you everyone for your time today. And Ken, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, this this webinar. And we appreciate uh, all of the information you've presented. And, and uh, I think you've really helped to show how wind and solar can work very well together. Thank you again thank for you your time. Very nice presentation, guys. Thanks, everybody. Take care.